everybody, everyone. Very warm well, welcome to you all today. It's so nice to see you all here at the Lord's House on a very cold morning. My name is Tab and this is Gloria and this morning we're really glad to be up here to share with you some of our thoughts about this pulpit theme. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dearest Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for bringing us safely to your house today. We thank you for your abounding grace that has kept us throughout the week. Lord, as we come to you today, I pray that you'll please help us all to clear our mind of any distractions that we can focus solely on you. I pray that you'll help us to offer worthy worship to you today. And as a word is given, I pray that you'll help us open our hearts to receive this word. We want to thank you once again, in Jesus' name. Amen. So over the last month, we've been studying what it means to glory in the knowledge of our Lord. For the last few weeks, something that has stood out in the messages is how knowledge of God was always intended to produce faith and that it would meant to lead us to greater faith. This is something that I'm learning very practically through the messages at YPG. At YPG, we're learning from the book of John, studying the interactions that the Lord Jesus had with people throughout his ministry. I find that this study is so relevant and applicable to me because on a daily basis, I probably speak to about 50 people. So since becoming the manager at Sumo Salad in Burragoon, my interactions with people have increased dramatically, whether it's with my staff or with customers or uh, people working in our supply chain, my bosses or my boss's bosses. It's constantly speaking to people, and it's learning as I go a new, um, a new level of speaking and dealing with people. In the first few weeks starting this job, I found that it was really easy to become frustrated and to lose my patience in how I spoke with people. Hospitality and customer service is not an easy industry to remain calm and collected in. But this is where the Lord's Word does bring some encouragement through the example that the Lord Jesus set. It's so true that the scriptures do teach many wonderful and applicable lessons. But something I've been learning very boldly is that Jesus would always speak to people with so much love and grace and kindness. Throughout his ministry, he knew how to demonstrate sensitivity and compassion in the way he spoke to people, but always with such wisdom. Learning these things about the Lord Jesus does bring me back to thinking about the person of God. In Jeremiah 9, verse 23 to 24, it reads, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Our Lord is a God of righteousness and one who wants to practice loving kindness towards us. And even more than that, he delights in, knowing, in us knowing this about him. The more knowledge that I gain about our God does really just make me so much more confident about my faith in him. The inspiration for our first hymn this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 25, and it reads, Therefore, whoever does these sayings of mine, who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. There is so much importance in us learning and gaining more knowledge of God. This passage is emphasizing the wise man who not only hears God's word, but does it. And the challenge is to be that one who lays for themselves a solid foundation. Whether we are learning from main worship or from YPG, Sunday school, or the various messages throughout the week, I'm just so glad that we have such a steadfast foundation that we can build our faith on. In the third verse of our song, it says, His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. 
As we learn more about our great God, may we keep in mind that he is the God who is our rock, who keeps us strong when the trials of life come. So may we sing our first song this morning, number 404, The Solid Rock. Thank you for your singing. As Tab said, my name is Gloria, and this theme has been a challenging one for me, but also one where I have found a new appreciation to know that there is none like the Lord because of his everlasting and unfailing love toward his people. You know, this is something that I appreciate even more. Um, Over the last month where I had the opportunity to gain some work experience um, doing some admin work. And I finally understand what Nick was talking about last week, about not having enough knowledge when you first enter the workforce. You know, it was a very humbling experience for me because of the many mistakes I made um, on the job because of the many things that I didn't know how to do. Um, One of the things that I had to do was to assist the occupational health nurses in um, directing candidates to the nearby clinic so that they can have their appointments done. But the one incident that stood out to me was when I accidentally pointed one of the candidates in the wrong direction. You know, before the candidate came in, I, I researched thoroughly where the location was just so that I knew exactly how to tell him where to go. You know, I was so scared that I was going to give him the wrong information or the wrong direction that um, I Google mapped it before he came. I GPS it on my phone and I rehearsed speaking it to him in my head multiple times before he came. You know, but... Unfortunately, all of this practice was, um, it came to nothing because when he did come, instead of telling him to walk down the street on the right and turn to the left, I told him to walk down the street on the left and turn to the right. (laughs) You know, after he left, it was only then that I realized that I told him the wrong directions. And for the next 20 minutes, I was fretting within myself because I was so sure that he was going to come back and be really angry at me. You know, but when he did come back, it was not the response that I was expecting. Not only was he not angry at me, but he smiled and he just laughed the whole thing off when I apologized. You know, this is something that I really appreciated because of the grace that was shown to me to forgive me for my mistakes. Through the messages that we've been learning on glorying in the knowledge of God, I really appreciate this truth about how there is none like the Lord. Looking at how far the children of Israel had drifted away from the Lord and how they turned to rebellion and walked according to the dictates of their own heart, it reminded me of how sometimes my heart can be inclined to worthless things instead of the knowledge of God. You know, the mistake that I made in giving the wrong direction to that one man was a once-off mistake and only happened once. But sometimes my struggles and my mistakes in my walk with the Lord happen many, many times. You know, and from time to time, when I think about these mistakes, I think about how impossible it is for me to perfect this walk with the Lord. And in my heart, I think, you know, then why do I even try? But yet, at every turn, just as the Lord has provided for the children of Israel a way out, he also has provided us this hope too. In Jeremiah 31, verse 3, Jeremiah says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. This verse has become more special to me because I know that in it is my hope. You know, nowadays the word love has been so overused and its meaning has been watered down. But I know that these words that Jeremiah is saying is true because it is spoken by a righteous and faithful God. And this means, this makes all the difference to me. You know, Israel used up all their chances when they decided to depart from the Lord, but he continually outpoured his loving kindness onto his people you know, when they were so deep in sin. And in sending his son, 
this hope and loving kindness has been outpoured to us as well. Our next song for this morning is hymn 408, Have Faith in God. In this hymn, it says that he knows all the ways we have trod. He never forgets and answers our earnest plea. His heart is touched with our grief and despairs, and he will provide for us, though all we see are our problems and mistakes. You know, a lot of the time when I look at faith in the Lord, all the responsibilities of having to walk in righteousness flood my mind, and there are so many things that I know I still need to cultivate. And the responses that could come are to either rebel or to give up, because I know that because I'm afraid that if I do try, I will still fail him. But one verse that I have come to appreciate is taken from Psalm 27, verse 14, where David says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know, it brings me comfort to know that This Heavenly Father is one whose hand is not shortened to reach out to us, but that he looks down from heaven and wants to be involved in our faith and our life. Please join us in taking up our next hymn, Have Faith in God. Thank you for your singing. So our last song for this morning is No, Not One. Gloria and I spent some time this week to ponder over these lyrics and to meditate on what the songwriter meant. We both came to appreciate how there really is none like the Lord Jesus, and really nothing can compare. This song lists 13 different attributes about who the Lord Jesus is. And through it all, the thing that stands out to the both of us is that he is who he is and does what he does out of love. This morning we would like to share with you a Bible verse each that reminds us of God's love. You know, a verse in the song that I really like is the last verse where it states, Was there a gift of a Savior given? No, not one. No, not one. Will he refuse us a home in heaven? No, not one. No, not one. I appreciate this verse because it reminds me of a precious Bible verse taken from 1 John 4 verse 10, where it says, In this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave his son as a propitiation for our sins. You know, this is a precious truth for me because it refocuses me back to the Lord and his love. You know, we are able to respond in love for the Lord and toward each other, not because we knew it beforehand, but because he first loved us. And this, and it is this first example of love that has impacted my heart to want to grow in my knowledge of God. You know, in that through his immense grace and mercy, he would give his only son that would that we may have a life more abundant. So the verse in this song that stands out to me is actually the chorus where it reads, Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And this reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, where it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as come into man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I draw a lot of comfort from this verse because I treasure knowing that I have a God who not only knows my limits, but would allow the testing of my faith to only be within my abilities. And even more than that, he has already got a way for me to get out of my struggles. This speaks volumes of God's love to me, because he is one who is faithful, one who cares about me, and who wants me to grow, but he won't abandon me th- during my struggles. You know, as we reflected on the verses that were precious to us of the Lord, we really stand in awe of a God who we are privileged to have this opportunity to relate to and to know as we continue to grow in our knowledge of God. There is a comfort and gratefulness to know that there is truly none like the Lord. Would you please rise with us, and as we take up our last hymn, No, Not One. Please be seated. Thank you for your singing this morning, and we'd like to pass the time over to Pastor Chris.
Okay, thanks, girls. Okay, we're going to take up, again, a study in the book of Jeremiah. Those who have persevered, well done. We're getting there. Chapter 31 now. Of course, we skip a few chapters. We're going to take the whole book without uh, we selected messages. Uh, we will be here for a very, very long time. Okay, but hope that it has been uh, uh, enlightening, helpful for us to read this together. And we all need uh, some assistant, some help to read the Lord's Word, to make sense out of it, and to see how it could help us with our life. Okay, and, and this is what we're going to do this uh, morning in particular. We're going to read the Lord's Word together. And sometimes we, it's, it's just one verse or one text that could help us. Okay, and, and so we take Bible memory verse and select them and, and f- seek to understand it that we may find the encouragement we need. Okay, well, let's take a look at uh, a text here in Jeremiah 32 before we pray together for a while. And here is a, a reminder from God to Jeremiah, a servant of God, and he needs that encouragement. Please don't think servants of God don't need encouragements. And he was an encouragement. And Jeremiah 32, verse 26, right? Okay, well, let's read this together. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And the word that grabs my attention is the word too hard. We often look at so many things and we say it's too hard. It's too hard to get up in the morning. It's too hard to read the Bible. It's too hard to walk this life Jesus meant us to walk. It's too hard to be a good parent. We are often at war with our children. When they learn, before they could speak, we wish they speak. And when they speak, we wish, why they speak? (laughs) They learn to speak back. My son, four years old, has learned to now give a reply. In the past, it was, James, do this. Okay, okay. Now, why? Well, suddenly it dawned upon us. He's growing up. He's, well, you talk back. And there you go. And there are days when we feel it's just too hard. On the one hand, we know the promises of God. On the one hand, we know he says, this is like a reminder. I am the Lord. I'm the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard? Maybe for you, yes. But for me? Is there anything too hard for me? Can we seek the Lord? This is why we encourage people. Well, let's come to God. Is there anything too hard for Him? Take our focus back to God. And that is always the challenge of reading the Lord's Word. It helps us to focus back on God. We look at what we need to do and what we, our own ability, you're right, it is, is often too hard. Too hard. And that's something we want to look to. Well, let's be encouraged to discover what God can do and is not too hard. Sometimes we think we have gotten in a mess so impossible to resolve. It's too much. It's perhaps too hard, even for God. Not too hard. Okay, well, let's pray together for a while and look at this wonderful text that we are going to take up in Jeremiah 31. Let's pray for a while. Our Father, we pray this morning that our hearts will be uplifted a bit more as we focus on your word, as we learn a little bit more about you. May we find that faith to know and believe that it is not too hard for you. We may pray that we will have such a faith. 
to be able to cope with whatever we need to face. We ask that you would bless us as we study this text once again in the book of Jeremiah. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So far, we've been reading Jeremiah, and it has been pretty dark, actually. We see all the problems of life. You see, we are such that we don't like to see problems. Who likes to see problems? And we, you know, here's a problem. Sometimes we look at the news, I switch off the news, you know, nothing but problems. We don't want to talk about the problems, but we cannot but see them. And it is very dark. We see all the painful problems that exist in, in Israel in particular. And we wonder whether they could even ever get out. What were some of the painful problems? One glaring one, there was just so much division. There was fighting among brethren. The nation was two nations. One is like North Korea, South Korea. They're meant to be one Korea. But there are two. How come there are two Korea? Hey, they're fighting each other. Right? I have my, my, a good friend of mine is uh, Korean, South Korean. And he used to tell me stories of how the entire nation will go into battle mode when if a, Unidentified flying plane cross the border. The whole city is, is ready for war. And of course, you have uh, you know, the leader there that threats nuclear weapon all the time. And the division. You see, Israel had a division that went back all the way back to the days of Jacob. They began. Twelve sons. Jacob himself did not have a very good relationship with his own brother. Twins. You imagine twins, right? They, they had good relationship. Esau and Jacob fought all the time. Even though Jacob and Esau eventually reconciled, the two, part, the two families never saw eye to eye. Esau became the leader of his own nation, the Edomites. And they fought Israel. They became enemies. This is a brief history of Israel. The family, how divided can you be? That a brother would sell another brother. They sold Joseph. Their brother, own flesh and blood. They sold him to become a slave of Egypt. The 12 tribes became the 12, the, the, the family, sorry, 12 families became the 12 tribes. They were meant to be one. David, the king, had the hope, the dream of a united nation to unite the families of Israel together. He believed in it with all his heart that it would be possible. He was the only one that united the nation. After him, there was no other king that was capable You see, this is the same for us. We see so much division among families, among nation, among people that are meant to be brethren. And it is so painful. You wonder whether it is ever possible to be one people. My people. How how does that make sense? Take a look at this verse in chapter 31. I like chapter 31 because in the midst of darkness, this is the light. There is light. And this is the light. Without this chapter, there's nothing but darkness. This is all darkness. This is all problems. But there is a ray of light that is just really special. And so we read, at the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. God of all the families? At that point in time, the families were fighting each other. They were two nations, northern kingdom, 
made out of ten tribes, called Israel. Southern kingdom, made out of two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, of course, absorbed by Judah, so it is called Judah. It has been for the longest time. Divided by a border. Two kings, they have their own religious system, they have their own everything. They never saw eye to eye. Brother killing brother. Brethren attacking brethren. They became enemies. How bad can that division go? It had come to a point, no one would ever think that they can ever, ever be one people again. I wonder whether we have ever felt that hopeless. You go to see the problem is taken too far. Is it, there is no more hope. This is too messed up. This is too painful. This is too separated. There, how can you ever, ever be restored? Now this is this one word. I will be God of all the families of Israel. It's a really profound thought. How is that possible? And it has to be, it has to come back to God. Know that a God would look at this and offer hope. Okay, now let's take this, this text bit by bit. We have two parts. One, in Jeremiah 32, he's called the God of all flesh. Right? All flesh, meaning the whole world. And we look at the whole world. Wow, this is just so much division. Is it possible? Now, let's break it. Sometimes you look at the too big, you need to go down. Smaller. Let's look at what God says. I will be the God of all the families of Israel. Let's start with the one nation. Let's let that become an example. Right? This becomes an example. Israel would become an example to the entire world. That it is not impossible for God. Maybe impossible for man, but not impossible for God. Right? So you see with an example. Look how many problems they had. They had uh, serious sin problems. They had, they deserted God. They were destroyed. They were scattered as a result of their sin. They were divided like anything. Any hope. And so we start here. This will become the model. An example of what God can do. What will God do? Now, well, let's take a look. This is what God will do. This is very, very special. He will do more than offer relief. Now, let's take a look at this. At this point, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Obviously, they survived. Those were the survivors, right? Israel, I went to give him relief. There's so much pain. You just survived the sword. Here is some relief. And we all... Oh, sometimes you look at the weak, you look at the, we're like surviving. Just survive. If we can find some relief, right? We will be so happy. We, so we find relief. Relief in food. Relief in taking a holiday. Relief in, maybe in our family. Well, some, for some it is relief. For some it is not relief. Right? We, that God will come and Give some relief. Is that all God wants to give? No. There's more than that. Look at what God was planning to do. In verse 3, the Lord has appeared of old to be saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt. Well, that's what he's going to do. This becomes an example of what it means to have unconditional love. Right? We, we, we look at love today, very, very conditional. If you are good, 
uh, you, know, you, you get a reward. If you are, uh, if you are achieve something, okay, more love to you. But if you don't do well, you stupid person, you, then love diminish. Love in the world is so conditional. It really is conditional. It's earned. And here is an example of unconditional. I will love you with an everlasting, unceasing, unconditional, unceasing. And this love that he speaks about, I will build you. I will bring you together. That is something really, really special. How does that work out? Well, let's, let's look at this. Here are the promises, a whole list of promises. Okay, let's take a look. If you have a, I have a highlighter. I, this chapter is an old light, so I use a light yellow. And, and highlight these wonderful, in the midst of all this darkness, there is light. Right? I have loved you with an everlasting love. And then draw you with loving kindness. How precious, how wonderful that is to be drawn. That's God's choice. He wants to draw people to himself with a love that is everlasting. I will rebuild you, he says. Look at verse 9. They shall come with weeping. Okay, now look at verse 6 first. I, I like, it may be a short phrase, but it offers a lot of hope. For there shall be a day. Oh, there is a day. We look at today. So many problems. There shall be a day. And that day, this is what will happen. They shall come with weeping, with supplication. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water. In a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am, the, I am a father to Israel. See, the whole idea of God as Father did not begin in New Testament. Way back here, you see this. I will be a Father to you. That is so special. To be a loving Father to you. You see, when, you, when there's a family that is in turmoil, there is problems in the family, it is a lot of children are neglected, unloved. What does God offer? I will be that personal to you. Father to you. Look at this. And what will he do? Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Declare it to the nations. Remember the whole idea of an example? This will be the future. He, will, he who scattered Israel will gather him. And keep him as a shepherd does his flock. He will lead them. Verse 11. He says to, to them, The Lord has redeemed Jacob. He's ransomed him from the hand of one who is stronger. He will redeem them. He will be father, relate with them, lead them as shepherd, redeem them as his people. In verse 12. Therefore they shall come and they can sing again in the heights of Zion, streaming to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and new wine and oil for the young of the flock and the herd. Their souls shall be like well-watered garden. Your soul shall be like a well-watered garden. Have you seen a well-watered garden? It's a nice sight, right? I've also seen gardens that are not well-watered. Not a nice sight. It is dead. Right? That's the, that's the state of the soul. In other words, the restoration of the soul. The restoration even of joy. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, the young man and the old together. See the word together. Divided, separated, built up. Now, from there... Darkness, here is light. Here is hope. Together rejoicing. Young and old, I will turn their mourning to joy. I will comfort them and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance. 
And my people, that's our key phrase, my people shall be satisfied. You know, you read things like that and you think whether it is ever possible to be satisfied. A lot of the time we are not satisfied with life. There is a thirst in our soul. This is, we look at it, we, can we say honestly, we are just satisfied. Is there a day? There shall be a day. Well, this is what God is going to promise and offer. And it is going to take a very, very special work of God. And it's something we want to really think about. That a God would offer this. First, he will say this. This is what I would not want to do. This is what I am going to do. And then he puts it into a covenant. All right, now look at this. This is this chapter 31, of course. We have the covenant, which is called a new covenant. Okay, well, let's take the two parts together. And then we see how, the two, how all this is put together to be applied to us today. Okay, now verse 31. We read, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The two, the two divided houses. Not according, bringing them together. How will they come together? Not according to the covenant that I've made with their fathers in the day. I took them by hand, led them out. This is called the, the covenant, in other words, made with Moses. Which they broke. I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. So this is called a new covenant. Not a renovation. Not an add-on. You see, this is, the, this is my life. There's so many problems. It's broken relationship. It is not repair work we need. It is a complete new work that needs to be done. That covenant is gone, broken. Here is a new thing, a new covenant. And in this new covenant, we have the following features. Look at this. Okay? And he says, I will put my law in their minds. In verse 33. Look at the whole list of things here. I will put my law in their mind. I will, I will be their God. I will write it in their heart too. I will be God, their God. They shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Oh, that is a very gracious and special covenant. When God makes a covenant, he keeps it. See, we all struggle. We struggle with reading the Lord's word and we say, how come we read and we don't understand? We look at it, we, we draw a blank. Nothing gets true. You're going to need this covenant. But God will say, I will do this. I will cause this to happen. I will put it in your mind. You realize, hey, how come I remember the Lord's word? How come it is in my heart? There's a sense of relationship with God. He's my God. The sense of people, belonging to his people, it's in you. And you know it, it's in you. You know the joy of forgiveness. 
You know, just the thing, God remembers my sin no more. Well, people, we remember our sins. People may remember our sins if they do it. And it's terrible. I will not remember your sins anymore when I've forgiven it. And that is just that freedom, that dignity that can return. That is that joy and restoration. You know, you look at that and you say, wow. Is that just a special sense of hope and grace and love from God? How does one respond? You see, this is a work that it, it really is going to take God. So when people say, Pastor Chris, it's so hard to read, it's so hard to walk with God, you know, you almost want to give up. You look at it, the Lord says, you've got to live this kind of life, righteous. Oh, so hard. I want to give up. For you, it is too hard. For God, what is too hard? This is where the new covenant is so special. Okay? And I I really, I said to those who are translating, by the way, those who are translating this morning, uh, who's translating? How come their mouth is not moving? (laughs) Nobody needs translation. But they, they've come prepared just in case anybody needs translated. The three of them, they are related to me. And they will always ask me, how do we understand this message? Your outline and what you say, the 15 minutes spent with you. Oh, that, that message is so different. Yes, the difference between theory and life is very different. So I applied it. So I said to them, our family began with just a few one. There's a few people that know the Lord, came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For myself, it was 18, 19 years old. Right? And then from that one, today when we celebrate Christmas as a family, we have well over 60 people who come. My family alone can have a mini worship service. A sense how we cannot but stand in awe that God has become God of the families to us. Made up of different families. And together as a church, families. And we cannot but to stand in awe of His love. What draws us together? The Lord's love. What draws us together? How God is building up. I will build. I will lead. I'm father to you. That is just so special. Really special. Right? Well, this is that. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to share with everybody. (laughs) I can? All right. I have his permission. (laughs) You know, I was really concerned when my dad said to me, uh, Chris, I went for a calcium reading test, a calcium test to test my heart. He's concerned for his health, and, and so am I and, and oh, all the time. And so he said, the score came back. Normal, if you have a calcium reading of 500, please go and see the doctor because there is plaques in your arteries that could be blocked. Okay? My dad's reading was 2,000. This is all, what all the rich food does to you, ladies and gentlemen. Your seafood, your right, all the nice things you eat. And I said, what? We must follow up. So we, this week we went to see a cardiologist and she tells my dad all the things he didn't want to hear. No more dim sum. No more crustacean. I, I looked at his face. And he's... <laughs> Uh, no more this. Do you exercise? He smiled. I answered. Wow, these are all the things you're going to need to do. I said, Dad, well, I'm going to be there for you. I love you too much to, to think that your life can be cut short because of food. Well, I'm going to be there with you, for you, not just pray for you, but to see doctor with you. Everything you know, that is going to be said, he doesn't hear it, I will hear it. 
And I will tell people, and I will sh- we will share it with the church. Last night we were talking, and we said we need to share this with our brethren, with our family. He celebrated, my dad celebrated his birthday yesterday. We shared with the family openly. This is where we're at. You see, we want to look at the problems and not avoid it. And not say, I don't want to think about it, just a little bit, never mind. That's all how Asians think. A little bit, never mind. A little bit, never mind. Until... Wow, what happened to my heart? We want to look at it. We want to say, is there a solution? Is there a hope? Well, oh, let's work at it. There is a hope. Okay? You, you got to, he's got to do what's called a stress test. They're going to stress his heart out to see whether there's blockage. But we will go the course. You see, in many ways, that's what God meant. Is it too hard for me? I will be there for you. I am there with you. I will build you. I will be father to you. I will be shepherd to you. I will lead you. And when you go through all that, I will bring you together like you've never been before. These problems in life will not destroy you. It will bring you together. As one people. My people. And so we openly share challenges with our family. We, we say we need the Lord. We say we seek God. And we will. Therein is our hope. His unconditional love for us. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And with loving kindness. I draw you to myself. So my prayer for my dad was, Lord, draw him closer to you. This is my prayer for all. This is my prayer for those whom I know. What are you going through? Is it too hard? Then read Jeremiah 31. Don't just read, believe in it. Do we believe the very words we say? We say there is nothing too hard for God. But God will ask the question, is it too hard for me? May our reply be that is of no. How do we come to God? So it humbled my dad. and It is humbling to look at all these things. But the best best way to deal with problems and anything is be humble. How must we respond to the Lord? And we're going to talk about a proper response is needed. Up until point, Israel did not have a proper response. A proper response is to take action. Not just listen, yeah, yeah, okay, I know the problems. Okay, okay, tell me I know the problem and do nothing. That is not a proper response. So what the doctor tells you, if you don't respond in this manner, you are going to have a lot of problems. What is a proper response to God if we can understand this? This is his part. What is our proper response? Well, take a look at this. In, in verse 18, this is a proper response. Up until point, there has been no proper response. And we need a proper response. Verse 18, God says, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. You have chastised me, and I was chastised. Like an untrained bull, restore me, and I will return. This is remorse. You know, you look at it, and it says, you know, I was an untrained bull. I am chastised. I deserve this. You know, you are just, you remorse over the, the problems, you remorse over the sin that has been committed against God. This is how one must return in verse 8. Look at this. I restore me, I will return, for you are the Lord, my, you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning, I repented. And after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. Ah, This is, sometimes you need to do things like that. You must strike yourself, don't forget. An injury, well, don't forget this. 
Because so easy to forget. We make so many prayers of asking for God's forgiveness. After a while, we forget. To him, this is the last straw. I must not forget. I've got to return to God. I am going to repent now. Repent, turning away from the sin. I am going to now, I was instructed. I'm going to be instructed and I'm going to be corrected. Receiving instruction and correction. That's how you know there is genuine repentance. When the person will receive correction and instruction. Right? Up until this point, they did not offer to God any proper response. They said, I'm sorry, but pride was still there. They would say, okay, I understand. And then, yet, their heart was still hardened. Nothing will ever change if we hold that position. Until we understand it and say, Lord, I, enough is enough. Okay, so when my dad says, yeah, enough is enough. Enough dim sum. Enough this. Enough that. Enough. I must change. So I ask him, what did you eat? Tuna sandwich and only half. <laughs> well, that's a good change. All right? We must, don't forget. So I tell you, don't forget. Remind, don't forget. The temptations will come from outside, right? Somebody will invite you, a.k.a. my aunties. Let's go dim sum. <laughs> you say no. <laughs> Look at this. I will change. Right? Dad, love you too much to let you go into all these things. That's what it means for God to love us. He doesn't want us to go that way. Same thing. I don't want to see any one of us to go that way. This is why we share it openly with our brethren. So if you haven't, your calcium score is above 500, please do something. If it's 2,000, if it's 3,000, right? Do something about it. Can we? You say, enough. I will come back. I will go back. I will say, Lord, I, I, I would. Be drawn to your love. I will be corrected. I will be built up. That's what God wants to do. That we could sing again. That the joy can return to our soul. He says, I will satiate. In other words, I will satisfy your soul. Your very soul. More than all these things. That has draw us away. May this word be a, a challenge to all our heart, okay? Really challenge to all our heart. I'm, I'm talking, no puns there, all our heart. Heart. Not just physical, but, but the spiritual heart. Let it not be hardened. Because we often focus on the physical, but there is a spiritual hardening of the heart. Don't harden your heart. Let the Lord do a special work in it. And He wants to do a special work. It begins with an individual, the family, and collectively as a church. We speak of family as a church. We have seen how God has brought together our family. We've seen how God has brought families together as a church right here at Bethel. And that has been a wonderful blessing. And so when we go to celebrate our anniversary, we think of nothing. We will sponsor tables. We will give young people, you are family. We're not just going to care for our own immediate children. We care for the children of others. Of course, those who cannot afford it. Those who are struggling. And we want to care for them too. But of course, why? We don't just say we believe in God. It must come forth from our very life. He says, I will be God of all the families. And our joy to receive that and to say, well, this is our privilege. That's what God, that's what John wrote. Whoever receives Jesus, Jesus gives them the right to become children of God. And it is our joy and blessing to be 
part of that great family of God. May our hearts be challenged to strengthen and guard this family we have in the Lord. And may our hearts be blessed. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the glorious hope that we have in the midst of so much darkness, division, pain. There is hope. There is light that comes from your word to give to us that hope of what you can do. Nothing is too hard. Make us believe once again that truly nothing is too hard. Help us to find that faith to be not overwhelmed by the problems in our life, but to believe again that you are truly the God of all flesh and there is nothing too hard for you. We ask that you would bless us. May we see ourselves treasuring this word and that believing in it will cause fruits of faith. We ask that you would bless us as we give an offering this morning to give with a heart that know you and love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I see how deeply rich a life can be when they believe in the Lord's word. To me, my inspiration is a person called the Apostle Paul. You know what Jeremiah wrote? He says, what God says, I will, I will be God of all the families of Israel. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 3, prayed, and this became part of his life. And he says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And he prayed for a deeper understanding and love, of love, understanding of the love of Jesus. Same word. Where did he get this idea of the God of all the family? Right back, Jeremiah. We believed in it. And you see that soul become revived. You see that soul rich. You see that soul live wonderfully. And so that has always been an, an inspiration and aspiration for, for me to see a revival. When people begin to believe in God's word, you will always see a revival. That's my prayer. And so I, we conclude this morning with a hymn that is actually a prayer. Revive us again. Okay, well, let's, let's take this up. This is 295 in the hymnal, and it is a wonderful hymn. And pray, revive us again. Reviving that faith, revival of that heart, revival of that spirit. Certainly a revival of that love for the Lord. Let's rise as we sing this together. May there be a revival. May there be a desire to be revived. Let's sing this together. Let's pray together. Let's ask that the Lord would hear this, our prayer, of asking that he would revive us. May we ask and seek this with faith in our hearts. And now may this great and mighty God of ours, the God of all flesh, the God of all the families of heaven and earth, do a wonderful work of revival in our hearts. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and his love draw us close to himself. And in doing so, strengthen our bonds with each other as fellow brethren. May the Spirit of God fill our hearts that we would walk worthy of this glorious calling to be children of God, now and forevermore. Amen.